friends we will make a beginning with the new topic economic reforms in india yes we studied two chapters in this particular uh, macroeconomics we got the understanding of the different problems that uh, we were facing in the economy now in this particular topic government is trying to address these problems in what way and what sort of reforms that government brought to see that those problems faced by the economy are well addressed so now to start with economic reforms since 1991 see what is the year of economic crisis 1991 is known as economic crisis due to the following reasons number 1 low foreign exchange reserves see what is the reason that we face the economic crisis we have got less foreign exchange reserves the available foreign exchange reserves were just sufficient to finance the imports of 3 weeks whatever that we are importing from foreign countries to pay those imports for 3 weeks only sufficient reserves are there now the next situation is national debt constitute 60% of the gnp in 1991 in the national income as a percentage of the national income if you see the debt obligation of the government is about 60% and there is a high inflation the wholesale prices increased at an annual average rate of 12% during that year and what are the reasons for this kind of situation is one is we have gulf war see our major energy production happens with the oil once there is a problem in the gulf what will happen the oil prices will go up once oil prices go up it will have a direct impact on our economy then hike in the administrative prices of uh, many essential items government need to increase the prices administrative prices for the essential commodities and also there is an excess liquidity in the country so people have got uh, the lots and lots of money but uh, the production is less so supply is less demand is more and uh, you have got surplus of the money which is there in the what is it uh, the country's economy so these are resulted in the inflation and all these are the causes for the increased inflation as a point then government thought it fit to make certain reforms to control this particular inflation and these reforms are brought in the area of industrial sector financial sector external sector and uh, fiscal policy so now what are the reforms that were brought in the industrial sector let us make a clear study of it prior to that we have got a concept of licensing if somebody want to start an industry they need to take the permission of the government in the form of license so post 1991 we have abolished that license raj and we made certain uh, free systems that is if somebody want to establish a particular industry they need not obtain the permission in case if they are going to set up that industry in an area where population is less than 1 million and many of the industries are uh, kept out of the license purview only few industries are only kept with that uh, license concept so industrial licensing was abolished for all projects except for 18 industries of course at the present if you look at in 2009 we have only six industries which relates to the health strategic security only that remains under the industrial licensing so if anybody wanted to start industries in a 
dealing with alcohol, cigarettes or hazardous chemicals, electronic aerospace and defense equipment and industrial explosives and drugs and pharmaceuticals only in these areas you require to take the permission of the license from the government but other sectors are kept outside the purview of the license concepts. Then defense production for the first time in 2001 friends defense production was opened for the private sector. Of course we have taken care of what only those companies who has got a minimum capital of 100 crores can only set up an uh, defense uh, items manufacturing company and uh, a minimum capital of 100 crores would be required by the company seeking entry into defense production and foreign investments in those companies is permitted up to 26 percent. In that particular company which is starting defense production company 26 percent is being allowed the foreign investment. So that company shareholding 26 percent can be held by the foreigners is a point. Then exemptions if industry is located in the cities where population is not more than 1 million there would be no requirement for obtaining the industrial approvals from the central government except for the industries which are subjected for compulsory licensing in all other say, industries if you want to set up a company a factory in a place where population is less than 1 million there is no need for you to take any licensing except to those industries where compulsory licensing is a, a prescribed as a point friends. Then industries which are reserved for the public sector only government can uh, start the companies in which areas only 8 industries where security and strategic reasons were reserved exclusively for the public sector of course now that list came down and only 3 industries are within the purview of that particular licensing concepts that is they are atomic energy and then substances specified in the schedule of CG in department of uh, energy and rail transport atomic energy rail transport and uh, substances which are specified in the schedule of CG in the department of atomic energy only these are being kept under the what is it uh, purview of the public sector only public sector government companies can only engage into these particular areas. Automatic clearance for imported capital goods is allowed in the following cases. See you require machinery capital goods means uh, what a machinery. So if you want to import the foreign capital goods what we say automatic clearance we are going to give for the imported capital goods of course in which cases where foreign exchange availability is ensured through foreign equity. See if I want to purchase a particular machine from the foreign country what I require money which I need to pay in foreign currency. As long as in your company as long as in your company the equity that is your share capital may foreigners edhi wo invest kare to, taking that particular money that company can acquire the what is it uh, the machinery from the foreign country. So we are encouraging what private entrepreneurs to start the companies and they should invite the foreign direct investment and uh, using that foreign direct investment they can very well purchase the capital goods. Capital goods means plant and machinery and all that. So if the value of the imported capital goods is less than 25 percent of the total value of the plant and machinery up to a maximum of uh, 2 crores. Of course in other situation in case if the planted machinery which you are importing from foreign country is less than 25 percent of the total plant and machinery then subjected to a maximum of 2 crores you can happily freely import the capital goods from the foreign countries as a point. Then we have also liberalized the foreign investment policy that is we have permitted foreign investment to enter into the Indian economy. So approvals would be given for direct foreign investment FDIs foreign direct investments that is uh, up to 51 percent of the equity in a uh, high priority industries. Yes if it is a high priority industry we invited uh, 
what is it foreign direct investment to the tune of 51 percent and to provide access to the international markets majority foreign equity holding up to 51 percent of the equity would be allowed for trading companies primarily engaged in the export activities so companies now can very well invite the foreign investment and foreigners can invest in indian companies and maximum foreign direct investment in any company's equity should be restricted to 51 percent as a point then a special empowered board would be constituted to negotiate with large number of international firms so we have also taken a reform step that let us regulate this foreign investment also we will constitute some special empowered board which is going to negotiate with the international firms is a point then friends permitted fdi that is permitted foreign direct investment that is in some industries we have permitted 51 percent of the foreign direct investment in some industries we have permitted 100 percent of the foreign direct investment in some industries we have permitted only 74 percent of the foreign direct investment what are those industries where 51 percent of the foreign direct investment is allowed 34 high priority industries are specified wherein automatic approval would be available for direct foreign investment up to 51 percent of the foreign equity these are all where 51 percent is only allowed when it is a high priority industry in those 34 high priority industries of course list you need not by heart that is uh, we in we allowed only 51 percent of the foreign direct investment whereas in the industries like uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals hotels tourism career services oil refining mass rapid transport systems airports business business to business e-commerce in all these areas we invited even if the company has got 100 percent foreign direct investment still we permitted those industries to run in india and then 74 percent of the foreign direct investment is allowed in banking sector and then 49 percent of the foreign direct investment is allowed in the air transport service 26 percent of the foreign direct investment is allowed in the defense production and insurance and uh, print media and uh, of course 100 percent foreign direct investment is allowed in some more areas like internet service providers electronic mail and voice mail special economic zones certain telecom industries advertisement in film sector t and for development of the township in all these we have permitted 100 percent of the foreign direct investment hitherto we were very rigid prior to 1991 we were very rigid we have got lot of apprehensions and uh, we removed all those apprehensions and liberalized the economy opened the gates for the foreign direct investment to come and enter into india with certain regulation then mrtp act the, we have also started with the mrtp act and that mrtp act the main object of it is to eliminate the monopoly tendencies in doing the business so the main object of this act was to eliminate monopoly powers monopoly means only one person controlling the what is it entire market in order to avoid such kind of situations we have started with the mrtp act as a point then we will study friends reforms in the financial sector in the banking sector what sort of reforms were uh, uh, brought to see that uh, we will improve economically one is and uh, to control the inflation bank rate has been reduced to six percent and uh, crr cash reserve ratio is 6.5 percent since may 2007 earlier it was five percent from january 2005 till april 2007 and statutory liquidity ratio was reduced to 25 percent in the recent years what is all these ratios that is reserve bank of india will ask the banks to maintain this much of the reserve so that what will happen once banks need to maintain these reserves then the amount which is available for with them to lend the money to the general public will come down once money flow into the market comes down what will happen friends naturally it will act as an anti-inflationary because 
inflation is defined as what too much of the money flow into the market and uh, purchasing uh, capacity of the people being uh, a more such kind of situation you call it as a inflationary situation so once you are able to reduce the money flow into the market naturally what will happen it will help us to reduce the inflation as a point and uh, towards that direction only reserve bank of india which is a regulator will instruct the commercial banks to increase their cash reserve ratios and statutory liquidity ratios so that it will help in uh, controlling the inflation as a point then plr primary lending rates are now set by the banks not by the reserve bank of india what is the primary lending rates are earlier used to be fixed by the what is it the rbi now they are left to the individual commercial banks to fix up and plr has been converted into benchmark rate for the banks rather than treating it as a minimum rate instead of saying that is a minimum rate compulsorily you have to keep it is being stated now as only a benchmark rates it is only in the advisory situation it is for the individual bank to decide at what rate it need to lend the a money is a point rate of savings deposit was reduced to 3.5% in the recent years so banks how much they are paying interest on the savings deposit is only 3.5% and public sector banks can approach to the public to raise the resources this is a what is it phenomenal change earlier in the public sector banks entire investment is of that of the government only now nationalized banks are able to make the pub, raise the money through public issues almost all the nationalized banks have gone for the what is it uh, the public issue and uh, raised the money requirements of them through the public issues and it, there is a lot of uh, trust on uh, non performing asset what is non performing asset friends in case if the bank gives loan to any person and if that person is not properly servicing the interest properly not paying the interest or the installment then such a advance you call it as a non performing asset so at the time of 1991 the non performing assets which are there with the bank are at a very high later on a trust is there given that you have to bring down your non performing assets so to reduce the non performing assets banks are advised to sound their credit risk management system and the, there is a credit information bureau would be established to identify the bad risks so government also established a credit information bureau and it is helping now the banks to tell which customer is what kind of the customer what is the risk of uh, what is it giving the money to him or lending the money to him is being prescribed friends we were discussing about the reforms part and the point here is how we were able to bring the reforms in the banking sector already i explained the point like there is a institution which got established which we call it as a credit information bureau that is going to give the information to the banker in case if the banker want to know the credit worthiness of any customer who is coming and asking for the loan earlier since this such kind of institution is not there there is a chance that banker may get into a problem by lending the money to a wrong person then recovery of the debts due to bank and other financial institutions act 1993 was passed and a special recovery tribunals were set up to facilitate quicker recovery of the loans arrears point here is the biggest problem that the banking sector suffers is from not able to recover the loans there are so many measures which are taken by the reserve bank of india to protect the interests of the banks and the public at large because ultimately it is the public money which is there in the banks 
if a person who takes the loan if he is not repaying then bank suffers and ultimately deposit holders will suffer so the regulator has taken all these uh, uh, steps to strengthen the banking system in fact we can proudly say that indian banking system is a strongest banking system in the entire world then afflate 3 4 years back we got this securitization and reconstruction of financial assets and enforcements and security interest act sarfazi act now banker straight away can go for making the auction of those properties which are given as a collateral security to the loans taken by the borrowers in case if the loan repayments are not forthcoming properly this is a very powerful instrument in the hand of the banker in case if the there is a defaulting borrower they will make use of all the powers which are given under this act and bank will be able to realize the a money then friends financial sector reforms if you look at the financial sector reforms mainly these reforms are related to three categories one is the banking sector reforms which we just now studied and then capital reforms and insurance sector reforms now of course in the syllabus of the cpt we have only banking sector reforms which we have studied thoroughly then reforms in external sector like exports and imports what uh, the way in which we are now looking at this export and import in a new era that is new schemes to promote the exports duty drawback scheme cash compensatory scheme 100% export oriented units export processing zones these are all there that is in order to encourage the exports in case if you are doing the exports whatever the duties that you are paying a part of it we are going to give it back to you such kind of situation you call it as a, a duty drawback scheme and government in order to increase the exports also is compensating the people by way of giving the cash and all and then this 100% export oriented units in future you are going to study the income tax there under the income tax law you will find several exemptions and deductions being given to the 100% units set up in the export processing zones and which are export oriented units for them under the income tax law there are several concessions and income tax benefits are, are given as a points then new organizations are started to promote the exports like export promotion council commodity boards federation of indian federation of indian export organizations and the trade fair authority the indian institute of foreign trade these are all the organizations which we have established to promote this particular foreign trade because basically the awareness must be brought among uh, the business people in india what are the avenues for them in the foreign trade and all and they should be encouraged and banks are also given some instructions thereby they are also encouraging the people who are involved in the foreign trade by giving them good guarantees and loans then exchange rate stabilization the rupee was devalued twice in july 1991 amounting to a cumulative devaluation of the rupee by 19% it got devaluation then what we did is import licensing that is earlier if you want to make the imports you have got the license raj here also some amount of liberalization is now we are looking at while we need certain capital items for importing into india so liberalization was given a push with announcement of exim policy 1992 the policy allowed free trade of all items except negative list of import and exports 
barring few things which are stated in the negative list of imports and export friends many items free trade are brought under the free trade items quantitative restrictions are removed on 714 items in the exim policy of 2000 2001 and on the remaining 715 items in exim policy of 2001 and 2 then imports of all kinds of consumer goods are now allowed except the defense goods environmentally hazardous goods and some other sensitive goods then average applied tariff rate is reduced to 15% in 2006 and a 7 is a point consequent to this liberalized import licensing policy you have average applied tariff rate which got reduced to 15% then friends we have got the export subsidies yes in order to increase the exports government has given certain subsidies that is direct subsidies are not provided to the exporters in india indirect subsidies are provided in the form of income tax duty concessions or the export that is customs duty and excise duty concessions are being given for those who are engaged in the export and then friends export finance export insurance export guarantee and export promotion marketing assistance these are all being taken up by the government to see that properly the things will improve and exports wise we get a good ranking in among the world countries then export promotion of capital goods scheme was introduced in 1990 to encourage imports of uh, capital goods finally export income has been exempted from the income tax so this is a, a very very good encouraging thing that uh, if you are involved in getting the foreign income by way of by making the exports naturally such ex- export income has been exempted from the income tax then friends schemes abolished exim script scheme was abolished with introduction of dual exchange rate scheme and of course certain things friends please to remember you are going to get a full idea as you proceed in your future studies so wherever it is required a due explanation i am making but some situations we are skipping it off but because you have to learn about that in an extensive manner where it can it's not possible for me to explain that particular concept in detail under this particular topic i am skipping it of such items but don't worry regarding those items in other topics we will discuss in detail in future then friends cash compensatory scheme these are the schemes which we have abolished today all what the encouragement we are giving for the export is duty drawbacks we are giving and uh, subsidies we are giving not direct subsidies but in the way of uh, income tax concessions and all we are giving and we have liberalized to a greater extent this uh, export import uh, business is a point then foreign exchange reserves what do you mean by foreign exchange reserves foreign exchange reserves of india consist of foreign currency assets held by the reserve bank of india and gold holdings of rbi special drawing rights sdrs these all constitutes the foreign exchange reserves what constitute foreign exchange reserve is an important question from the examination point of view foreign currency assets held by the rbi gold holdings of rbi special drawing rights sdr foreign exchange reserves are above what is it 141.5 billion dollars in 2004 and 5 this would be much much more now in 2009 then fera foreign exchange regulation act 1973 was withdrawn with a new act called as fema and 2000 was applicable fera remained applicable for 27 years after its being introduced in 1973 we have got fera till 27 years that is 2000 now we are with the fema objective of the fema foreign exchange 
Management Act are facilitating external trade and payment and promoting orderly development and maintenance of the foreign exchange markets in India is a point. See the whole lot of objective of the foreign exchange FEMA is to see that we make a good balance of payment situation and external trades and payments need to be properly be done with and promoting the orderly development and maintenance of the foreign exchange market in India need to be done. So your FEMA is helping you to achieve that. Then Vishesh Krishi Upaj Yojana was started to promote the agricultural exports. So now the country is encouraging even the agricultural produce to get exported and uh, there we have started a scheme called as Vishesh Krishi Upaj Yojana and then duty free export credit DFEC scheme was converted into the served from India scheme. Now looking at uh, those reforms in the foreign policy that is uh, your uh, reforms that we have in the export and imports. Now I move to the what is it fiscal policy what are the important uh, reforms that we brought. Yes fiscal policy in the sense that is income tax reforms these all comes under the fiscal policy reforms. First thing is the tax rate of the individual got reduced to 30 percent. It got reduced to 30 percent and then the tax rate for the domestic companies earlier hitherto it is 40 percent now we brought it to 30 percent. The tax rate for the foreign companies earlier it used to be 55 percent now it is 40 percent. And the requirement of filing the return under 1 by 6 scheme that is earlier how it used to be you needed to file the return once you are the owner of certain specified economic assets. Now requirement of uh, filing the return under the 1 by 6 scheme got dispensed of and uh, scheme for submitting the returns through tax return preparers, TRPs taking the help of the TRPs filing the tax return a scheme a beautiful scheme got developed. So these are all the reforms which we brought in the income tax area. Then of course friends we have got the other reforms in the form of liberalization, privatization and disinvestment. These also helped a lot in uh, what is it uh, revival of our economy which were which has which is saw a very great danger in 1991 from that situation we brought all these concepts of liberalization, privatization and disinvestment. Of course let me remind you that these are all the moves which were taken by the our uh, great leader from Andhra Pradesh P. V. Narasimha Rao in the regime of P. V. Narasimha Rao we have seen the what is this, this liberalization, privatization and uh, disinvestment uh, from the public sector and all, public sector investment and all. Now let us start with the what is liberalization. What is liberalization? Liberalization means giving a relaxation to the restrictions on the trade. Earlier we closed our doors, now we have opened our doors and we invited the foreign direct investment and also we opened our gates for facing the competition from the foreign players also. So liberalization means giving relaxation to the restrictions on the trade for example removing the tariff subsidies and other restrictions on the flow of the goods and services between the countries. Now there is a free market and entire globe is becoming a small village now restrictions which were there hitherto are now all taken away as a point. That is what we call it as a liberalization situation. Now my market geographically got increased. Now from India I can do business at any part of the world is a point. Then what do you mean by privatization of public enterprise? What is this move of privatization of the public enterprise? In our country public sector is finding 
itself unable to generate the adequate profit those companies which are run by the government are slowly becoming a sick because of the various reasons that made the government to think of making privatization of those companies which are otherwise they are run by the government so they are becoming weaken and weaken day by day as a result of which demand for their privatization has a rise in then privatization refers to a process that reduces the involvement of the government in the public sector enterprises for example privatizations are as and uh, that is uh, how the privatization happens friends first transfer of ownership on the assets from public to private sector transfer of ownership on the assets from public to the private sector entry of private sector industries into the areas which were earlier otherwise exclusively reserved for the public sector and recent example for that is telephone industry and uh, the mobile services how open to the uh, private sector is a point now you have got in telephone telecommunications so many service providers airtel tata so many people entered earlier it is only bsnl and mtnl are only the two players now transfer of management and control of public sector undertakings into the private hands slowly we have invited the what is it uh, the public parts private participation into the public sector undertakings then we are limiting the scope of public sector or no more diverse, diversification of existing public sector undertakings all these moves are made for what purpose friends slowly we wanted to privatize the areas which were earlier there in the hands of the government which were not running properly with the private participation and by allowing the private players to enter into that kind of the business naturally we are trying to bring some competitive environment and we expect that under the competitive environment public will get benefited because of the good services that will come to them then arguments of course are there in favor of privatization arguments are also there against the what is it privatization is a point friends what are the arguments in favor of the privatization let us have a look at that is the incidence of a growing inefficiency reducing profitability and mismanagement of the indian public uh, sector enterprises has compelled us to think in terms of the privatization what forced us to go for privatization that is there is a, a growing inefficiency and reduced profitability and mismanagement reasons are many again let me tell you that is uh, strong labor unions workers unions political interference and lack of uh, motivation lack of competition all this resulted into such kind of sickness now what made us to think of privatization is that when it is said that privatization will improve the competitive efficiency reduce the political interference produce the high quality products and uh, then it provides a better quality services reduces the wastage and optimizes the resources so following are the main merits of the privatization first on government lot of burden will come down government is supposed to what is it supposed to regulate the business and supposed to regulate the people and provide good services so instead of directly doing the business government can act as a regulator thereby a lot of burden it can reduce get uh, relieved of so it will reduce the burden on budgetary resources also see companies are being managed by the government itself means again government has to manage them for managing it requires some money and our budget allocations are more going to maintain the public sector undertakings means definitely it's a lot and lot of burden so with the privatization what is happening is such kind of the burden will get out and then once the company is a government owned company political interference will be there very well we can reduce such a political interference once uh, we invite the private participation into the public sector undertaking then naturally with competition and all efficiency will get uh, improved and then quality also with competition what will happen quality products also will come unless you show the quality 
you will not be able to stand with the competition. So naturally quality improvement will be there and uh, since now markets are opened and uh, you are competing with the what is it uh, a foreign player also. So now in that situation you are now supposed to become strong and become efficient and uh, render good services and provide good goods then only you can meet with the international competition. And uh, then friends revival of the securities yes, with privatization and all what happened we were able to revive so many securities as a point and after private participation into the public sector undertakings what will happen naturally diversification ideas also will come and they are well getting diverse is a point diversified is a point that's what you will see now banking companies doing insurance business insurance companies doing banking business postal department thinking of doing insurance business so many diversifications are now possible with private participation 